1 Peter 1, please. And our text here is verse 23. 1 Peter 1, 23 says, Being born again. Anybody in here know what it means to be born again? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Did you know you were born again by a seed? Your, your human body, your physical body, is the result of a human seed. It's a corruptible seed. If there had been no human seed, you wouldn't have a body. Well, your recreated spirit is born from a seed too. But it's an incorruptible, other translations say imperishable, can't decay, can't die seed. And that seed is what? By the word of God which lives and abides Forever. Keep reading the next couple of verses. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falls away. This, this body's amazing. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, but in its temporal condition, it is truly a flash in the pan. <laughs> and we really should not get so bent out of shape and worked over it here because it really is here today and gone tomorrow. Our body is just like a flower. It grows, it reaches its prime, it blooms, then it fades. But the Lord has fixed it all through Jesus. And one of these days, this mortal is going to put on immortal this corruptible is going to put on incorruptible, and we're going to physically be changed. And then we'll have a body that matches our spirit, that cannot age, that cannot die. We've never experienced anything like that, but we're going to. Anybody believe we're going to? You believe the Bible? Well, soon and very soon. We're going to find out what a glorified body can do. I think it can run fast. <laughs> I think you won't be have to be you won't have to be concerned about what you eat. I think you won't have to labor over fixing your hair all the time. <laughs> maybe you maybe you just get up in the morning and say, I think I'll be a redhead today. I think I'll be blonde. I think <laughs> it's going to be great. You watch and see. It's going to be something else. But right now, it's mortal. It's aging and actually decaying. Not a nice thought, but <laughs> we're born again from what? incorruptible seed, which is what? The Word of God. Uh, and in God's Word translation, it says, you've been born again from a seed that cannot be destroyed, but through God's everlasting Word that can't be destroyed. Not from a seed that can be destroyed, but through God's everlasting Word that can't be destroyed destroyed. Why don't you confess that right now? Say, I am born again, I am born again of, an word, of an everlasting word, of an incorruptible seed, of an incorruptible seed that, cannot destroyed, that cannot be destroyed. It helps you to relax when you realize I'm going to be around forever. Not my body in this state. You wouldn't want to be around in this state forever. But my spirit, I'm going to be around from now on. And my body's getting fixed real soon. In uh, 1 Corinthians, if you'd look there in the third chapter, 1 Corinthians 3, 
And verse, uh, about verse 7, I guess it is. 1 Corinthians 3, back up to 6. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now when he said he planted, what's he talking about? What did he plant? It was the Word. Why was it planting? How was it different from what Apollos did? When Paul, as an apostle, brought, and one, this is one of the characteristics of the ministry of an apostle. Uh, an apostle ministers where others have not ministered before. An apostle lays foundation that then is built on. There's anointing and grace for that. An apostle starts things. God does through them. He said, I have planted. So he, when he preached and taught the word to them, the saints at Corinth there that later became saints at Corinth, they had never heard the word. They had never heard the gospel. They'd never, never heard anything. This was brand new to them, so it was planting. But then Apollos came along later, and he, uh, he taught them. The scripture tell, lets us know he was a teacher of the word. Well, what did he teach them? The Word of God, the same truths about the gospel and redemption, some of the same things that Paul had given them, but since they had already heard it, this is now watering. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Verse 7, neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. Verse 8. Now he that plants and he that waters are one. Now this is a little... Uh, unclear in the King James. If you read other translations, it says the planter and the waterer are equal. Revealing that watering is just as important as planting. Just as important. And he said everyone will receive his reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. One translation says, you are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. Say it out loud, I am, I am God's, garden, God's garden, his field, his field to, be to be planted. What does he plant in you? His, word. his incorruptible seed, which is his word. Now please don't think, don't assume you already know this. This takes mind renewal to get this. Just because you've heard these verses and you say, yeah, I heard that, I know that. No, no, that doesn't mean you have it at all. I, I talked to a person I, I was visiting one time in the hospital and uh, I recommended some scriptures for them to, to look at, meditate, and speak over themselves. And they said, oh, you mean that? The Bible, they're talking about, they said, I read that. Well, just that statement reveals they have no concept of what we're talking about, these verses. They don't understand how it works. Faith is not knowledge. Y'all with me, friends? Just because you know something doesn't mean you have faith. Faith, knowledge is of the head. Faith is of the heart. For with the heart, Man believes, Romans says. And the way God does things in us is that he speaks a word to us. This is the way he does everything. How many have read the beginning of the Bible? How did the heaven and the earth come into existence? He speaks something. And when God speaks, it is not just to communicate. It is not just to express his thoughts or his feelings. When he speaks, he creates. When he speaks, it changes things. And the way he, he creates in us and changes in us is through his words. And he'll speak a word to you. And if you receive it, that word will go into you. Is that the, is that the end? No, it's the beginning. Come on, can you see that? What needs to happen now? You may see no change on the outside. Well, you won't. At that point, you won't see any change on the outside. 
What happens next? You need to water that seed that he put in you. What does that mean? You need to think about what he said. You need to ponder it. You need to speak it. You need to hear about it again and again tomorrow and the next day and next week and the next month. And if you will, what will happen? It'll start growing in you. It'll start developing in you. And if you let it stay in you and grow to its full cycle, it will change you on the outside. It will change your life. But how many know that so many folks have no concept of this? They, they, you know, we live in a microwave, drive-through, instant message generation. Hmm? And uh, I've mentioned, and I've said it before, you know, I used to work at Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry. We had a healing school there, and I worked there for a number of years. And I, I, I brought it up from time to time. I said, you know, I think we'd get more business if we had a drive-through window. <laughs> at the healing school and people could just come through and you could reach your hand out and go Shundai be healed and they could press the accelerator and, and peel off but and God does do instant things don't misunderstand me but his regular way of, of functioning and doing things all you got to do is look around the whole earth how does the plant world operate how does marine life in the ocean operate? How do animals on land operate? How, does, how do human beings? It's seed and it's development and it's harvest. That's his way of doing everything. And so it's not, not see how quick you can get in, take the notes, okay, I heard it, got it, let's go. Not how it works. You got to hear it and then hear it again and then hear it again and think about it. Talk about it. Meditate on it. Hear it again. And you'll get something different the next time. You'll get something different. And what's happening? It's starting to bud. It's starting to put down a root. It's starting to develop in you. And if it stays in you long enough, it will manifest in this realm. Amen. It will manifest in wisdom and knowledge. It will manifest in joy and peace. It will manifest in protection in provision, finances, healing. Come on, are y'all with me? Restored marriage, relationship with your children and grandchildren. God has an incorruptible seed. You know, you know it kind of reminds you of the, the, the fable about Jack and the beanstalk, you know. <laughs> he had that bean, and man, that thing just, you know, nobody would believe what it would do. Well, this is not a fable. Every one of God's word is not magic, but incorruptible yeah. seed. Yeah. And what it will do will just blow you away yeah. if you will yeah. let it get in you. Amen. The devil knows this, which is why getting the word out of you and away from you and getting you away from it is his top priority. It was real easy this morning for millions of people. He just dealt with them, roll over and go back to sleep. Right? We, we got extra seats in this place that could be filled. Got extra seats in Branson that could be filled. Well, it didn't take much for them to be robbed of something that could change their life. And not to judge, you and I have done it before. Right? But we're getting smarter. Is that right? We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. Go with me to Luke 8, please. Luke 8, verse 2, I believe it is. Well, verse 3. Uh, how about 4? <laughs> when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, Jesus spoke by a parable. He said, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. 
and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground. How many like hearing about the good ground? Good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Why, why would you need to say that, he that has ears to hear? Well, if you read Matthew's account, Matthew 13 and Mark 4, which also recorded this uh, teaching of this parable, he talks about that the prophet had uh, foretold that people would see and not see, hear and not hear, hear and not understand. Why? It has to do with your heart. The ears are connected to the heart. And only a willing heart allows a hearing ear when it comes to God's things. Now, this is something I, I'm seeing more and more the further I go in this. I used to think, when I first started in the ministry, that the greatest need, the, maybe the greatest problem with humanity was ignorance. People just didn't know. They didn't, and, and you know, Hosea says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. I thought, well, that, that's the biggest problem. People just don't know. If they knew about God, if they knew about the truth, if they knew about Jesus and redemption, they'd love him, they'd want it. They just don't know. But after a number of years in the ministry now, I realize that just ain't so. And I, I failed to emphasize the rest of the verse. In Hosea it said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The rest of the, that's not even the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse says, because you have rejected knowledge. God is faithful. He is making salvation available to everybody on the planet. He is giving everybody opportunities to see and to hear truth and to receive, but millions don't want to hear it. They don't want it. They don't want to acknowledge. If you acknowledge that there is a God and Father and He is the creator of all things, what's step two? Well, you ought to acknowledge Him and check in with Him and see what He wants you to do. See, that's a problem for much of humanity. They'd rather deny the existence of a God than they're not answerable to anybody. Do what they want, when they want. Rebellion, pride, defiance is the scourge of the planet. It's the real problem, not just ignorance. And what, that's what he's talking about here. Him that has it, because they asked him, if you read these Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8, they asked him, why are you always talking to them in parables? In other words, why don't you just come out and say it? He said, because to you it's given to understand, but not to them. What? Huh? Not to them. He said, they see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. Why? Why would that be? Look at the, uh, why would he have to say, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Back up a little bit. The first, he mentions four types of ground. Can you, do you know what they are? Wayside. What else? Stony. What else? Thorny and good ground. And apparently, Jesus had said, if you, don't, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand any of the other? This apparently is a granddaddy parable. This covers so many things. This is how he said the kingdom of God functions and operates. And it is sobering to realize through Jesus' teachings that 75% of the people who heard the word of God got no results from it. 
That's sobering. Is it true or not? Wayside ground. Did they get any results? None. Stony ground. Any results? None. Thorny ground. And we understand Jesus, Jesus explains it here in just a moment. The seed is the Word of God. The ground are people. And I reckon all humanity falls into these categories somewhere. And are we to understand that three quarters of the people who hear the Word of God are getting no results? Is that the fault of God? Is it the fault of His Word? It's not a seed problem. It's not a word problem. It's a ground problem. Amen. It would answer a lot of questions, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. As to why a lot of things not happening. But how many feel like me? I don't want to be any other kind of ground <laughs> except a good ground. Amen. So I've got to find out why was the wayside ground wayside ground? Because I don't want to be that. Why was stony ground stony ground? I don't want to be that. Why was stony? I got to find out or else how am I going to keep from being it and doing it? In answering what we were just talking about. Why would you say he that has ears to hear? Why would you say it's not given to everybody? Why? I mean that just don't even sound right. It is fair because of this. Wayside ground. Why were they wayside? Back up. It fell by the wayside. It was what? Trodden down. Somebody say trodden down. That Greek word means to trample. It can also be translated to reject with disdain. You don't trample something under that you value. And then Matthew tells us they never understood it. Why? You'll see this thought over and over in, in Proverbs, in Psalms, in other places. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and also the beginning of wisdom. The what? You could also say like this, the reverence, the respect. Why? Do the things of God just go right past so many people? They don't respect them. They got no time for them. They don't respect them. Who has ears to hear? People that value Him and value what He's saying and doing and are willing to hear it and do it before they ever hear it. That willingness of heart and that respect gives you an ear that can hear what others don't. How many want to have ears that hear? Then it comes from the reverence and respect. Now, we've, uh, if you had not been with us, we've already covered a lot of ground. We talked about the wayside ground. And so we're not wayside ground. Somebody say, well, I'm, I'm not wayside ground. We also talked about Stony ground for like, I don't know, three Sundays. And so we're not stony ground either. Are we? Come on, we're not. And if you hadn't heard it, you ought to get it. Go, go online, download it. It won't cost you anything. If you want a hard copy, a, a disc, you can get it at the Word Supply. It won't cost you anything. And, and make sure you get it in you so that you're not caught by these traps. Let's go on to the third kind. We just got one more kind. To make sure we're not. And then we can focus on what we, we are. We is. We are. Good ground. Can somebody say, I am. I am. By the grace of God. I am. Good ground. Good ground gets miracles. Good ground gets results. Now you'll be one out of four that didn't, but it's up to us what kind of ground we are. Uh, keep reading. In Luke 8, where were we, about verse 8 or so, 9, Luke 8, 
Yeah. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 9. His disciples asked him, what might this parable be? He said, to you it's given to know the mysteries of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. See, that, that's what we're talking about already. The parable is this, Jesus said. Man, this, this is awesome revelation. I'm telling you, these, this is right out of the mouth of the Master. If you look at other parts of this passage in Matthew, and Matthew, he said, you are seeing and hearing things that have been hid from the foundation of the world. Amen. That prophets and others desired to look into and didn't see. But you're seeing it. How many believe Jesus himself said this? This is right out of his mouth. The seed is the word of God. Come on, say it out loud. The seed, the seed is, is the Word of God. Do we value the seed? Do we value the Word? Yes, we do. Verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear, then comes the devil who is a thief. He's a thief. And the number one thing he wants to steal from you and me is the incorruptible Word seed. Because he knows if he can steal the word out of my life, he stole healing out of my life. He stole prosperity out of my life. I mean, we talked about this last week about the, uh, the stony ground and how that when per pressure and persecution came because of the word, by and by they were offended. And we, we mentioned how many people, church-going people, are offended at speaking in tongues. Hmm? Well, so the devil robbed them of that word. Do they need the ability to pray beyond their understanding and to build themselves up in the, on their most holy faith, to pray out mystery? Oh, they, they have no idea how much they need it, but they've been robbed. How many otherwise good people, saved people, church-going people, are offended at the word about sowing and reaping and abundance and prosperity. Oh, they despise it. They hate it. And they turn right around and ask for money. Talk about how much they need money. Don't realize they're shooting themselves in the foot. But has the devil robbed them of abundance? Why? How did he rob them of prosperity? By robbing them of the message. Robbing them of the word. There's a lot of people who are offended at faith and healing. Aren't they? It makes them mad if you bring the subject up. Well, the devil stole that message from them. And in so doing, he stole healing and miracles from them. Somebody say, not me. Not me. By the grace of God, grace of the God. devil will not. Steal the word from me. But now you've you got to have some perseverance. You've got to have some tenacity for that not to happen. He said, then comes the devil. Takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root. If there's no root, there's no fruit. It develops in you first. It goes down deep in you. Then it produces out. Which uh, for a while they believe and in time of temptation they fall away. And so now, uh, over halfway through the message, <laughs> we're to the next part. Amen. But I do this on purpose. I don't do it because I don't have any other enough material to make it through the time. Hmm? How many, how many would say, I didn't need to hear any of that that we just went over? I just, no, good, good. Uh, <laughs> if you'd never heard it before, what was happening? Planning. Well, what if, what if you have heard it? Do you need water? It's watering just as important 
as uh, planting. Because without watering, you get dry. Don't you? You get dry. And what if there's no water and the seed gets too dry? It just sits there. Now, corruptible seed will die. Great thing about God's seed, it can't die. But it can sit there dry for 300 years, which is more time than you got. <laughs> but the moment you start pouring some water to it, oh, watch out. Watch out. Here comes a sprout. Here comes a bud. Here comes a leaf. <laughs> Here's the third kind of ground that faith life people are not. Amen. They which fell among thorns, everybody say thorns, are they which when they have heard, they go forth and are choked. With cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So according to Jesus, 25%, a full quarter of the people who hear the word of God will be in this category. And they won't get any fruit. They won't see any results of the word in their life. And in this case, it won't be because they didn't value it. Like the wayside ground, because it got in them. And it won't be because it wasn't watered, because it obviously was. It won't be for lack of reception. It won't be for lack of depth. It won't be for lack of moisture. It won't be because they got offended and quit. Now, we, we need to be paying attention, don't we? Yes. This, the people in this category, they heard the word. They received it. They got excited about it. They watered it. It developed in them. They didn't get offended and quit when pressure came. Then how is it they didn't get results? Because of thorns. Somebody say thorns. 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 Thorns did what to it? Choked what? The word? Is there something that can choke the word out of your life? Almost sounds unbelievable. But these are the words of Jesus. You know they're true. Somebody say thorns. Thorns, the first reference you see is in Genesis. It's when Adam and Eve fell and it's the result of the curse on the earth. You don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 3, 17, he said to the man, because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife and you ate of the tree which I charged you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground on your account. In sorrow you do eat of it all the days of your life, and thorn and bramble it does bring forth to you. This obviously was a radical change. Apparently, before that time, you, the earth did not produce thorns and briars. So much of what we see in the earth today is not a part of God's original creation. He didn't make it that way. It's a result of sin and death and the curse. And so thorns and briars are part of the curse of the fall. And it's the same idea that these things can develop in our life to the point where they choke out the good word of God. Another place you'll see thorns is in redemption. 
Anybody remember? Before Jesus went to the cross? Or as he went to the cross? They platted a thing of thorns for his head. And they put them on his head, thorns, big old thorns. And the Bible said they beat him in the head too with a rod so they would hit him and it would drive those thorns down into his, his scalp. And this is connected with what Isaiah saw when he said uh, the chastisement of our peace was on him. Thorns have to do with the, the mind as well as the curse in the earth. Things that prick into your thought life and cause pain and cause distraction. Can you become so preoccupied with the problem that you don't give the word attention? That's what he's talking about. And it is a trick of the devil you see, I see it clearer just right now than I have before, right this moment. You see a progression from wayside to stony ground. Stony ground, they're doing a lot better than wayside. Can you see that? Well, you see it the same way from stony to thorny. Thorny is further along than stony. Thorny ground should have had it. Come on, can you see that? Why? Because they got the moisture. They got the depth. They, no matter the pressure, they won't quit. So what's a devil to do? <laughs> the regular stuff ain't working on this guy. Huh? He or she, they do respect the word of God. They keep pouring the water to it. They hold on to it. They don't care who talks about them or how much persecution comes. They ain't quitting. So how do you separate a person like this from the incorruptible word seed? Here's a tactic of the enemy. Isn't it wonderful that we're seeing the tactics of the enemy? We're not ignorant of his devices. What's he doing? He is the devil is the master of distraction. He is, he is the master of it. If there's something God wants you to see over here, what will the devil do? Hey, hey, over here, over here, over here. And there are few things that will get your attention more than a big old thorn. Ah, ah, Whew. Usually if you've got a big thorn stuck into you, you forgot about everything else. You are on thorn channel now, which is right where the devil wants you. Because what he wants you to do is water these thorns. Water the thorns. Water the thorns. Water the briars. Have we got any gardeners in here? Come on, any gardeners? Huh? If you've got perfect, beautiful seed for your flowers, for your shrubs, your bushes, your plants, and you've got the greatest ground, and it's deep, and it's fertile, and you've got the best water, and you keep it there, is there something else you've got to watch out for still? Yeah, yeah. What? Right. Other stuff. Yeah. Getting in your garden, getting in your flower bed. Is that right? Yeah. Weeds. Weeds, can they cause you a problem? Yes, oh, yes, they can. Weeds will get in there. They will suck up all your water. They will suck up all your nutrients in your ground. They will get big and shade out your good stuff and kill your good flowers and your good bushes. This is exactly what the Lord is telling us. This is, this is not a fairy tale. He said, this is how it works That's right. in your life. Somebody say thorns, thorns, thorns. Thorns and briars. 
What are the, he, he, he's specific. He goes into detail describing what these thorns are. Are you there? These thorns. He said that they were choked by these thorns. The word choke literally means to choke off, to suffocate. It's the same word translated choked when those pigs, you know, ran off the cliff. Said they were choked in the, in the water. Well, they drowned. Can you drown in worry? Can you drown in obsession for things? And riches. Can you drown in pleasures of this life? Yes. Yeah, you can. It can drown the word and thereby you. Uh, go with me to Luke, the 21st chapter. You're there in Luke, I think, but, or you were. Luke 21, 33. We're making progress, saints. Hmm? Luke 21, 33. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will, shall not pass away. Here's something wonderful. Everything, are we in the word today? Yes, we are. Everything you're getting about the word right now, you will keep with you forever. This atmosphere, the surface of this planet, going to be gone one day. But what you're getting about the Word, when you're reading your chapter every day, when you're feeding on the Word, when you get it in you, when it's growing in you, it's enlightening your mind, it's changing your life, you'll never lose it. It stays with you forever. Amen. His words don't pass away. They're the incorruptible, imperishable, undying Word seeds. Verse 34. Now notice what he says immediately after talking about God's words that don't pass away. Take heed to yourselves. Now uh, look at your neighbor. Help them out and, and, and uh, interpret it. Tell them, watch out. That's what take heed means. Watch out for what? He, he just got through saying about the word. And then he says, watch out. Watch out what? Lest at any time your hearts be what? Overcharged. Overcharged. Your heart. Well, that's where the seed's planted. That's the ground. Can the heart be overcharged? Listen to the Amplified. He said, take heed to yourselves and be on your guard. Lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed, weighed down. With what? Well, go back to the King James, then we'll look at the Amplified. With what? This says surfeiting. Most folks don't even know what that might be. Not surfing. <laughs> Not surfing, <laughs> surfeiting, and drunkenness. And what else? That's what he mentioned specifically as a thorn. Cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Look at the Amplified now. Take heed to yourselves, be on your guard, lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed weighed down with giddiness and headache and nausea of self-indulgence, drunkenness, and worldly worries and cares pertaining to the business of this life. What does that do to your heart? It overtaxes it. You can't worry about stuff all day 
and produce a harvest of the word of God. The thorns of the worry and care are getting all the life out of your heart soil. Can you see that? This is a trick of the devil. Isn't it? He wants to so tax the soil of your heart that it, you are just used up from, he mentions two things here. Basically, we'd say partying or worrying. Just fleshing out, you know, eating too much and everything and smoking and snorting and drinking and everything you're big enough to do, that will put your heart in a state where it won't produce harvest of the Word of God. And most Christians know that and they go, yeah, no, 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 I don't do that. But the devil's got something else for them. <laughs> worry. He's even convinced multitudes of Christians that worry shows you care. So really, worry equals love. I worry because I love. I can't help but worry. And the reason I worry so much is because I love so much. Bunk. <laughs> Lies. You're being played, my brother, my sister. It's not true. If you really cared about them, you'd want to do something that would help them. And you know worry never helped anybody. So you'd quit doing what you know can't help them and you start doing something that you know can help them, which means you have to discipline yourself. And oh man, the care will come to you a thousand times a day and you'll have to grab it and say no, 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 no. And you'll have to cast it down and you'll have to speak the word of God. And when you do, you just watered that word. Come on, you just watered that word and you grabbed that thorn and that weed by the neck and said, no, you don't. You got to come out of my garden and you jerk it out and you throw it aside and you pour some more water on that word. Come on, can you see this? I'm not going to let worries and cares choke the word out of my life. You have to say. I can't be full of worry and fear and be full of faith in the Word of God producing in my life. It's either or. The worries and the fears are going to suck the life out of your spirit and the nutrition and the water that should be nourishing the Word. Can you see this, friends? Amen. So your heart, that's why so many folks are so weak. Your heart can get overcharged, overburdened. And the problem is uh, the individual themselves are responsible for it. They, they, they want to act like they're a victim of circumstance and life is just hard. But Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. He holds us responsible for what condition our heart gets in. Did he not tell us? Casting all. Cast is a strong word. It means throw it. Huh? Man, I know some gardeners. They get serious when they see weeds trying to snuff out. Is that right? They're prized petunias. Or tulips or roses. Man, they get serious. Man, they, they wade in there and dirt gets to flying. Is that right? They grab this stuff by the root and they pull it out. They cast it out. We need to get serious about that in our mind and in our life. Get a hold of that fear. Get a hold of that worry. Get a hold of that anxiety and grab it and say, no, you don't. No, you don't. And rip it out. And cast, casting all your care over on him. Back to Luke 8, please. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said out loud, I'm not wayside ground. I'm not stony ground. I'm not thorny ground. 
Talking about by the grace of God, we're not. What did he say? Luke 8. And what's this? About verse, uh, yeah, thank you. They that fell on fell among thorns are they which when they have heard, they go forth and are what? Choked. They're suffocated. Drowned. With cares. What's a care? It's a worry. We'd call it a worry. It's an anxious thought. Anxious thought. And friend, you have to stay on your guard night and day about this. Hmm? I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord. And maybe this thing ain't that big of a deal to you, but this thing is. Maybe you don't worry about your grass or your bills, but if it's your kids, oh, oh, oh. If it's your grandkids, oh, if it's your, if it's your body, if it's your marriage, it doesn't matter what it is. A care still has the same effect on you. It'll tax your heart. It'll overburden you and choke the word out of your life. Choked with cares. And with what else? Riches. Now this, this doesn't just have to do with having something. It's the love of it. And it's being preoccupied with it. If all you think about is money and making more money and stuff, then that's What's getting watered in your heart and life? See, we are producing a crop all the time, good or bad. We're producing a crop. Something is growing in us. Whatever we're meditating on, whatever we're hearing, looking, talking about, feeding on, watering, it's growing. Good seed produces a good harvest. Bad seed produces a bad harvest. And pleasures of this life. Now this is a, this wouldn't have to be necessarily a bad thing. But if all you think about is stuff in this life, if all you think about is swimming or golfing or, or boating or, or playing, hmm? and, and you got no time, you got no time for church, you got no time for the word, then you could hear a life-changing word and even believe it and try to get it in you. But if all you focus on is this other stuff, that's what's getting the water. That's what's getting the nutrition. It'll choke out the good word. You remember, I believe it's in Luke 14, where uh, uh, Jesus told another parable about how that the one invited uh, people to the, uh, the wedding. And one by one, they began to make excuse. You remember that? And one of them said, I can't come. Right? Because I just got married, you know. And of course, I can't come. Uh, and others, I can't come because I just got some uh, oxen and, and I got to prove them, you know. I, uh, can you see preoccupation with home life? So you got parents that think they're the best parents in the world because they go to every soccer game, every recital, every practice, but they got no time for church. No time for the Word. That means the miracle working power of God's Word is choked out of them and their children's life. And they're training their children to put themselves first and not God. Amen. It's good to be at some stuff. It's good to support your children. But you need to lead by example. And there need to be times when you demonstrate, no, we don't have time for that this time because we got to put the word first place. We got to put God first place. We got to put church first place. Is that all right? The other guy said, you know, I just got some, I got some new oxen. I got some new equipment. I got my business. I got I to gotta get them ready, you know, so that they're ready for Monday morning because we got things to do. How many know if your family's first, God is not first? If your business is first, God is not first. And putting these things first will be thorns in your life and briars and brambles that will grow up until it, it chokes out the sun, it chokes out the water, it chokes out the nutrients that should be feeding the Word. Amen. You have to make choices in life, don't you? Yes. And there are times when you have to say, no, I, I can't do that because I'm doing this. 
No, we got a meeting this week. <laughs> Is that right? I'll deal with that later if I need to. I've found oftentimes when I put God first, the thing I thought I need to deal with after I put God first didn't even need to deal with it anymore. He took care of it. I've seen this happen many times. Water in the Word. Letting the Word grow until it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. Gets so strong in your life. The Word of healing gets so strong in your life. It pushes out weakness and disease and disability. The Word of prosperity gets so strong in your life. It pushes out debt and lack. The word of peace and joy gets so strong in your life, it pushes out fear. It pushes out distraction and depression. How many believe the word of God can overcome anything if, if, if we'll give it place and let it dominate our life? Stand on your feet if you would.